Uh, welcome to the last reading in this year's A.K. Smith series, a reading by our senior thesis writers from R to T. Um, we're going to go in slightly off alphabetical order since Melissa Sital needs to be across campus by 1.15 for a science symposium. Um, so the running order will be Melissa Sital, um, Julia Rubano, Jackie Sanders, Max Schaefer, and finally, Victoria Trentacost. Um, this is the culmination of work that they've been doing over not just the past semester, but the past four years. Uh, Melissa worked with Professor Cullody, Jackie worked with Professor Ferris, Julia worked with Professor Rossini, Victoria also worked with Professor Cullody, and Max was led astray by me. <laughs> um, so, please welcome the first reader of the afternoon, Melissa Sattel. Thanks. Kind of wish I wore heels. <laughs> okay, um, so I'll just get right into it. This first excerpt is from a story about a graduate student named Amelia who takes on a promiscuous persona, Eden, on weekend nights. It's called Boots. Soon enough, we found ourselves in his first floor apartment, and he led me to his bedroom as best he could. My ears were still ringing with the club music from 20 minutes ago. He kissed me sweetly at first, then began to take risks, his hands firmly grasping my elbows. He was not attractive in the traditional sense, but I didn't care. I could see the beauty in him. I speculated what exciting thing it might be that he wanted me to do. I imagined our bodies pressed together in various ways, in various places in the room. My heart raced and I could feel that I was going to enjoy this one. A couple more kisses and he stopped. What's up, I breathed, looking down at his lips then up at his eyes. I saw him taking me in. Not like the Sunday guy taking in my body like a Christmas present. This guy was taking me in with a maturity I forgot a man could possess. He was clearly intoxicated, but he was fighting it. His hands moved to their familiar place at my waist and I blushed at the intensity of his gaze. Before I could say anything, he started to speak. He asked me, as if it were a secret, are those shoes uncomfortable? I didn't quite know what to say. Take them off if you want, he continued. I want you to relax. I longed to make some coy but affirmative excuse as to why I could not do this. After all, my heel stayed on as long as possible. That was the unwritten rule, and it had very few exceptions. <coughs> Certainly, no one has ever requested that I take them off for the sake of my own comfort. I looked in his eyes once more. Brown honey, not a trace of ill intent. Try as I might, I could not think of any reason not to comply. The pain from the heels shot up through my ankles and slithered, slithered its way at my calves like snakes in a brush. The power and command they usually afforded me felt like nothing under his warm gaze. Nothing compared to flat boots and woods and Brian and the girl that felt full when she reached the summit of a tough hike. All I could feel was the pain from the heels. I kept eye contact, but he didn't seem to see the thoughts racing across my scattered consciousness. Standing, I peeled back the backs of my shoes away from my heels, one by one with the fingers of the opposite hands. Suddenly, I was five inches shorter, walking trails and climbing trees and sneaking around so that we didn't scare the animals. He had taken off his button-down in his v-neck in this time. I looked at him expectantly, but he simply held me, and we stood there, very human. I lightly stroked his back and drew circles near his waist. I was certainly not rendered defenseless by his request, but this felt intimate in a way I wasn't used to. I leaned up to kiss him and he answered me gently. I couldn't believe how natural it felt as his hand softly twirled the bottom of Eden's hair and I drew him to the bed to lie down. I wanted him to be different for me somehow and I wanted to be different for him. I was different. I wasn't the old Amelia or the seductress Eden. I was whatever I was supposed to be. He made me want to be this new Eden even after his time was up, even <coughs> during the daytime, in weekdays, in front of everyone. The satisfaction of knowing I could still change had a richer flavor than the satisfaction of the heels that lay abandoned on the floor. Never again did I want to face my old, stale life, buried with Brian and crusting up like the hole he put in his own head. We were not in sync. It was not fluid or flawless, but it was new. When we were done, I giggled with him and we talked like old friends. He asked me about myself and I told him, some things Amelia and some things Eden.
Okay, this next piece is a flash fiction called Quartzite. Mr. Sullivan talks about rocks. Igneous rocks are named depending on what they're made of and how big their crystals are. His words dance in front of me as if they are colors. The soft hum of the slideshow projector, the occasional shuffling of papers, and a woodpecker working someplace outside the window all create sounds that interlock with the colors of his words, and it feels like looking into a kaleidoscope. I am feeling lightheaded, so I stare at the cartoon rocks on the slideshow with unusual focus. My hands are clamming up, which is strange because they never get sweaty or warm. In fact, my hands are always freezing, a fact I try to hide by wearing gloves all the time. I don't want to look down at them because I know they're shaking. I keep them clamped between my thighs, my knobby knees pressed together. I might just give myself away. Now there is a looping animation showing the formation of sedimentary rocks. Tiny fragments of other rocks are carried by the river and fall together until they are compacted on the riverbed. There is no way to trace the origins of each little grain, or more likely, no one ever bothers. When the slide changes, the image of a compacted sedimentary rock appears, and it looks just like a slice of layer cake. The bottommost layer, Mr. Sullivan tells us, is the oldest, buried as more and more sediment washes over it. Sometimes memories come to me like dreams, but they don't feel like mine. My stomach, which usually feels like it isn't there at all, is getting back at me now. I feel pangs deep where the food should be, but I'm familiar with this feeling and I won't let it win. Mr. Sullivan glances at me for a moment and my entire body relaxes like a towel that someone finished wringing out. I cannot be caught. Examples of metamorphic rocks flicker into view. Quartzite is immediately my favorite. Soft, baby pink like a little girl's dress, but its jagged edges show what it's been through, heat and pressure. There is no trace of whatever kind of rock it once was. Mr. Sullivan says that rocks become metamorphic with enough heat and pressure. I believe him, but there will never be enough of either. I keep trying because it just feels good. I clamp my frozen hands together and attempt to focus once again. I imagine a rock inside my palms being forced into beauty. My whole body feels wound tight. The movements of my classmates feel like vibrations moving toward me. The fidgeter next to me sends the tap, tap, tapping of his shoes straight to my brain like a gong being rung. He and I used to do homework together, share our deepest secrets, make out backstage during drama club rehearsals. But now he is just the fidgeter next to me. I know that he cannot see me. I feel my invisibility. I've become nothing in a room full of childhood friends, ex-boyfriends, and potential lifelong companions. The images on the slideshow are melting together with the text, and my lightheadedness intensifies. I try to think back to the last time I ate food. It was probably five days ago. This makes me feel a bit better. I try to focus on my spine, jutting out of my back. I find myself wishing someone would see it, say something, say, hey, Kim doesn't look so good. She needs help. She needs people. Why didn't we see it before? But it's not going to happen. They can't see me. The last thing I see is Mr. Sullivan's concerned and confused expression as he looks at me for a solid three seconds. I feel myself rolling backwards in my chair in slow motion. I let myself shake, 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 body and hands free. Three seconds later, I faint. I wake up in the nurse's office with no recollection of passing out. I hear the nurse's voice in the distance calling my parents and my heart sinks. I look to my left and there's a fidgeter sitting beside me. He perks up as soon as I open my eyes. Are you okay? I was worried about you. School's almost over, but they let me stay here. I can't say anything. I'm still trapped in myself. No glimmer, no baby pink, no crystallized edges. I'm still just a series of layers, not metamorphosing, but eroding. He has come to watch me erode, but I don't mind. Maybe he'll bother to find out where all those little pieces came from. Last one, really short flash fiction. Uh, it's called Eyes. Waiting at his locker, same time, same place, every day. He's always late. You lean your head against the locker door uncomfortably, then shuffle your feet, then cross your hands and uncross them. Try your best to look like you're not trying at all. But all of your movements feel like trying to find footing while falling through the sky. So your body falls back to its naturally unimpressive gait. Your shoulders always hunch forward. Your hands are in your pockets, your eyes cast downward. It's dismissal, and no matter where you look, you see them. Your classmates travel in packs like migrating birds, in hierarchical formation, but they all look the same to you. Blonde hair, white skin, and eyes every color but brown. They all pretend to envy your darker skin, your thicker hair, but their comments feel as cold and hard as the locker you're leaning against, because you know that they don't want what comes with it. 
parents who can't go to parent-teacher conferences without a sibling there to translate, walking under the fluorescent lights of the hallway, feeling like a wingless blackbird among experienced flyers. Cheryl! You look up expectantly as your name is called, and see him moving quickly through the crowded hallway. You spring back to life. Your wings begin to grow, small and unimpressive, but enough not to fall. I was getting the homework from Jeremy, he says as he approaches. Then he looks straight at you. There they are, the only blue eyes you can call your own, set in his freckled face. They electrify you. You stare into him as he stares at you. You don't always have to wait for me, you know, he says with the air of someone who has been nervously rehearsing this line. He busies himself with twisting the combination into his lock, back and forth and back again. We could just meet at the bus. Yeah, I know, you answer as your wings shrink into your back. I would just rather see you here first. He quietly touches your hand in his trademark way, testing the waters, then relaxes into your fingers. I'm glad you waited, he says, taking the time to look at you. As soon as his eyes meet yours, you feel your wings spreading, and though you'll never know the secret to flying, you can at least stay aloft. Thank you. Okay, the next reader will be Julie, Julia Rubano. <laughs> okay, hi. Um, I'm going to read poetry. And um, before I get started, I just wanted to give a little shout out to Clarissini, who has read this literally 50 times. And thank you so much. I f feel really bad that you had to do that. But um, you get to listen to it again. But um, I'm going to read a couple different pieces that kind of speak to the mix of my thesis as a whole, which is called Blue Hydrangeas. Um, this first one. It uh, was inspired by a car ride my mom and I took up to um, a Gunquit, Maine when I was a kid. We were meeting my sister and my dad there who went a couple days earlier. And um, I wrote this poem for Professor Barry's class in his seminar last semester. Um, and yeah, it's called No Good Comes from North of Connecticut. <laughs> we were invited north to some place in Maine. So on a slow Saturday morning, we backed out of the driveway in my mother's old Volvo station wagon and headed up north to see moose eat lobsters. I-95 sweltered in the heat. I imagined the difficulty the woodland animals must have been having staying cool that day. When we came upon him, we must have been almost through Massachusetts because I'd just asked that we stop driving and go to Cape Cod instead. His head was bent backwards and one of his legs faced the wrong way at a 90 degree angle. My mother screamed and nearly hit the concrete barrier sitting idly in the middle of the highway. His golden fur was matted and in places painted a deep red. A blue collar barely visible around his neck. A single tire mark across the greater part of his belly. No other cars in sight. Later, animal control would punch into a car phone the numbers on his tags would tell the family that Sam, or Max, or something entirely unique had been hit on I-95 in this sweltering heat. And I'm sorry, but where did they live? Did they want to receive the body? Um, the second one is called Blood Bank. Um, and it's not really inspired by much of anything, um, except my mom works in um, Yale New Haven <laughs> Hospital. And I went to visit her visit her a couple of weeks ago when I was on a doctor's appointment and um, it's inspired I guess by uh, this doctor couple I saw talking over a couple of charts um, and they looked really sweet and I kind of imagined this is like my imagined version of them I guess in a more poetic fashion so blood bank we met over a bag of blood marked O negative you commented on the variety of colors in the plastic covers some violet, others crimson, deep blue. Outside, the moon waned to crescent, and somewhere in the nearby forest, a wolf stretched its head towards the stars to bellow. My brother needs a miracle, you said. The wild dogs howl trailing off into a whimper. He's running out of time. My speech moved too quickly inside of me, the thoughts hatching and fleeing before they had the attention, the, the chance, excuse me, to catch the attention of my tongue. I wanted to reach out, put my fingers to your wrist, feel the blood as it gushed towards your fingertips, but I felt naked in my own clothes. 
the clear sacks of plastic held together by cheap adhesive and bursting with darker versions of cartoonish blood never once broke. Um, these next two are in a three-part series. I'm just going to read the first two. Um, Professor Rossini noticed in when I first started working with her, because I didn't know her before this um, whole thesis process started, that my mom appears in like 80% of my poetry. And um, we, I talk about this in the preface to my collection, but our relationship was really rocky as a, when I was a kid. Um, she's a full-time professional still, but especially when you're little, um, that's hard as a kid um, and as an older sibling. And so I noticed when I started writing that she appeared in most of my stuff. So we decided to make a whole mother's section, kind of. Um, and this one is called Mother's Girl. And like I said, it's three parts. I'll read you guys the first two. It's chronological. One. My feet are wet, but she tells me to keep walking. It's your fault you didn't wear boots. The snow, pitiless, sits in frozen clusters on my lashes. I'm all skinny head and big lips, the opposite of my mother. Her eyes are blue and ecstatic, the left one littered with green flecks the color of hot summer pond scum. Its pupil, slightly off-center, is always dilated. My pants are too big. Sliding off my right hip, they're stuck under my sneaker's heel and soaking. You were right, I think. I should have worn boots. We slog down the east side of Signal Hill, past beachfront homes twice the size of our own, and I don't wish for a moment that any of them was ours. My mother walks past me, comes up around my puffer-coated shell of a body. She winks her left eye gently, and for a moment the mix of blue and green is just skin and lashes. That's when she pulls at the belt loops, loopholes I refuse to use, and she fixes me. Two. The earth feels wet and dry at once. It's March and always raining. A small reservoir by my childhood home floods at this time every year. So does the house's basement. Dad forgets to turn on some pump and mom yells, damn that reservoir. If only winter would dig its nails in around the eyes and drag this out. I'm not sure there's anything sweeter than the sound of, of snow falling. Every evening after my shower, I tell myself to do as my mom taught me. Brush my hair, which hangs long and heavy down my back, and braid it. Go to sleep er earlier than the night before. <clears throat> but the clock reads 10 and then 1. Rain pounds against my window's thin pane, and it feels like three minutes, but it's four in the morning. My hair's already dried into dreadlocks. I lie there wishing for another night lit by hushed silver snow of a by the hushed silver of an unexpected snow. But things move so quickly. It's March and always raining. Um, yeah, I'll read one more. Um, this one was, I think, the last poem that I added to the collection. Um, and it was inspired by an explanation I gave um, Professor Younger the other day in class about why I gave him, we did this thing in our film seminar called Ranga, and we had to make up like these fake names, um, and I chose something having to do with Snodgrass, um, because the first poem I ever recited and uh, memorized for the first time was by W.D. Snodgrass called A Locked House, um, and it's still like, my favorite poem and I can still remember it. And so I found that it kind of, his stuff appears over and over again, including in nicknames I use for senior seminars. So, um, yeah, this is kind of an ode, I guess, to um, Snodgrass and how he has kind of appeared again and again in my work. It's called The Home That's Not Our Home. I stand in the foyer. The red door we painted last summer is swung wide to the elements. Somewhere down the street, white noise pours from speakers, drifts through the entryway. I pad up the stairs. The bedroom door is closed, so I turn its knob and push. Take in our too narrow bed with its white, graying sheets still unmade. If I had taken the time to make our bed in the mornings, would you have stayed? 
Even after a wash and bleach, you are the stain on my subconscious sheets. In my head, I rearrange the moments. Elation, suffering, pain. To make our story make sense. Keep it alive the same way summer strives to outlive October. Every day, I wake in the bed that was ours. It's covers around my ankles. I still feel you housed in me. Feel your touch in the infant blue of morning. Thanks. Next up is Jackie Sanders. All right, so for my thesis project, I wrote a series, um, a collection of four short stories, and I had the pleasure of working with Professor Ferris as my advisor. Um, and I looked to previously published work and stories um, and authors that I liked for inspiration, and then I, be I based each of my stories on an older work. Um, and I will be reading today a shortened version of one of my stories, which is based on John Updike's AMP. Um, and that is about three girls who walk into a grocery store and they're in the late 50s wearing nothing but bikinis. <laughs> All right. It's called Sammy at the AMP. I felt the heated asphalt morph into linoleum as I walked through the door. The bare soles of my feet weren't used to the sharp change in temperature and it sent a tingle up my legs and through my fingertips. I tried to keep my eyes trained on the ground, tracing the light blue and gray tiles over and over. A distraction, any distraction, from the fact that I was practically naked in the AMP. I followed Susan as she walked over to the bread section and almost walked into her when she stopped abruptly. I had no choice but to agree with her earlier. She'd suggested we go to the grocery store wearing only bikinis, and when I tried to object, she just laughed at my face. Her mother had sent us for one thing, those herring snacks people love. Susan had her head stretched out of her neck like she was standing high and mighty in the store, but really, how elegant can you feel in the bread aisle? Susan and my parents had put us in a double room for this vacation, which is clearly not her idea, and although I was secretly excited, she seemed less than thrilled to be sharing a 14 by 14 space with me. Apparently, the idea of spending a weekend at the point with me was so unbearable that she had to bring her friend from home who barely said a word to me. This girl had jet black hair and bangs like Betty Page. I thought she was beautiful. I craned my neck around and saw a few middle-aged women about my mother's age. These women had blonde bobs, perfect, wearing cardigans and t-skirts purchased at the second-hand store a summer or two ago. One of them was looking at us, but the moment we locked eyes, she, walked, she looked away. I think she was more embarrassed than I was at that moment. She leaned over to a friend that was at the cart side by side, and together they started whispering loudly, all the while staring at us. Look at these girls, how inappropriate, how uncivil. Don't they know this is a fine Christian establishment? We turned the corner, down the cat and dog, food, breakfast, cereal, macaroni, rice, raisins, seasoning, spread, spaghetti, soft drinks, crackers, and cookies aisle, and on either side of us sat brilliantly colored packages begging to be purchased. I temporarily relaxed and reached out to grab the first package I saw. The shrink wrap felt cool against my palms. I heard a sharp laugh and looked up to see Susan turning around, winking at me, and her friend joined in too. I guess I'll call her Betty because she still hasn't introduced herself to me. <laughs> My palms were sweaty as I watched Susan's lanky legs propel her forward on the linoleum floor, away from the cookies and me. I tossed them back haphazardly on the shelf and followed the girls. Excuse me, sir, Susan said, leaning forward towards the counter. The straps of her bikini had fallen down onto her shoulders and they just grazed her tan skin. The bun that held her oaky hair had started to come undone, and now just a few f strands fell around her shoulders and face. I looked down at my own body, my pale stomach protruding from the space between the green gingham fabric. The man behind the counter came over and raised his eyebrows at what he saw. Hi, sir, could you please tell me where the herring snacks are, Susan asked. Yes, honey, they're over in aisle three, right next to us here. I watched him follow Susan's step as she wheeled around, walking towards the aisle. His eyes fluttered over her legs, her hips, her chest. When we made it to the aisle, I proudly pointed the snacks out to Susan, and she grabbed the smaller of two jars. Kingfish fancy herring snacks and pure sour cream. Susan ushered us to the cash register where she chose a gawky cashier about our age. He had dirty blonde hair that stuck up on the sides like he hadn't slept on his back but had tossed and turned around all night. Around his neck he wore a gold shining cross that contrasted with his pale hairless chest. 
His name tag read Sammy, and he looked each of us with a lopsided smile. His fists were clenched and he looked pale, uncomfortable to be there. But what I noticed most about him wasn't his awkwardness, it was the fact that he was staring at me, not Susan. His blue eyes made me very aware of what I was wearing. I folded my arms over my stomach. Susan put down the jar of herring snacks and the cashier picked it up, slowly studying the label. His hand slipped and he almost dropped the can, maybe from the cold, I really couldn't tell. Susan slowly slipped a folded dollar bill out of the center of her bathing suit, keeping a nonchalant look on her face. I blushed for her and Sammy did as well. He looked up at me and we stood for a moment, united under Susan's control, blushing because of embarrassment or intrigue. And then, the moment we shared was ruined by a large red-faced man coming out of a door marked manager. He looked each of us up and down and my heart sank as I knew this couldn't end well. I looked back at Sammy for help, but he had the same look on his face of desperation and maybe disappointment. Girls, this isn't the beach, the manager said, emphasizing the last word. I was too tongue-tied to point out the fact that we knew that. We weren't near the point anymore and I hadn't come from the beach at all. It wasn't my idea, it was Susan's. She could take the blame. My mother asked me to pick up a jar of herring snacks, she said calmly. That's all right, the manager said, but this isn't the beach. I saw Susan blush. Her face was a bright shade of pink, like the label on the cookies I had picked out earlier. I looked back at Sammy and he was watching me. We weren't doing anything, we weren't doing any shopping. We just came in for one thing, I said. The manager looked at me and shook his head. His right hand fluttered up, fingering that necklace. I noticed he was wearing a gold cross like Sammy. That makes no difference, he said. His eyes began to trace down my body. We want you decently dressed when you come in here. Susan pushed herself forward, her blushed cheeks fading. We are decent. I watched as Sammy slowly punched each key with his index finger, taking the time to calculate each movement. The cash register made little ping noises that were sharp against the soft background music, some instrumental flute piece. I wanted him to look at me again, just for a second, but he simply finished and handed Susan the change. She turned on her bare heel, immediately walking towards the door. Her chin was raised just as high as when we first walked in, and I snuck one more look at Sammy before, looking at, before heading out. We walked to my car quickly. I breathed out a sigh of relief, thankful to be back in my car and out of the A.M.P. The sticky heat in the car felt comforting, like a warm blanket being wrapped around my barely clothed body. Susan slid in the front seat, letting out a small laugh. Well, that was ridiculous. Who do those gorm think they are? In the rearview mirror, I could see Betty nodding, smiling too. Annoyed, I glanced out my window and saw the cashier from earlier walk outside. Susan and Betty's conversation faded away from my ears as I watched Sammy intrigued by him. He kicked a tire on a nearby car and it looked like he was talking to himself. He looked angry, fueling, completely different than the uncomfortable impression I got of him earlier. I wanted to talk to him. I wanted to apologize for causing the store trouble. I wanted to tell him that it was Susan's idea, not mine. I checked the rearview mirror and saw my dark curls frizzing from the humidity inside the car. I tried patting down my hair, putting one hand on each side, but it was no use. Oy vey, I heard my mother say in my head. <laughs> I unlocked the car door and got out. The hot asphalt burned my feet, but I didn't care. I needed to talk to him. I'll be right back, I yelled over my shoulder at the car, and I heard Susan question me, but it didn't matter. I kept going. As I got closer, I could hear him cursing under his breath. He was leaning against the car now, one hand rubbing his forehead and the other holding a cigarette. He looked up as I cleared my throat. For a moment, our eyes locked, and I saw his eyebrows knit together as he blew smoke out of the corner of his mouth. I sensed confusion as he squinted one eye, but then he relaxed, smirking as he sized me up. Close up, I could see his face, the small acne scars along his chin and forehead, the slightly damp clumps of hair along his neck. I could see he'd cut himself shaving this morning. He nodded his head. You got me fired, he said. His voice was loud but shaky at the same time. What? I quit, I mean, after you left. He looked down and then quickly back up at me. It wasn't fair, you know. You should be allowed to do what you want. Langle shouldn't have been like that. Langle, I asked, confused. My manager. He just did that because he wanted to please the customers. Because you're, you know. His sentence drifted as I continued to talk to him. Look, all I'm saying is he's a small-minded man, teaches Sunday school and whatever. He didn't want you three upsetting the customers when you aren't from here. His voice sounded like a hollow drum as he said the word from. All I could say was, I'm sorry. It's all good. I'll find myself another job, another mindless one to please my parents. He flicked a cigarette onto the ground. But you, you enjoy your freedom while you still have it. He was squinting up at me. The sun was blinding his eyes. I nodded. 
You want to go for a ride? He gestured towards the car. I couldn't read his expression. Um, I should be getting back to my friends. They're in the car, I said, but his eyes were looking straight at me and I felt my face heat up. I started walking towards his car, forgetting what I just said. For a moment, it looked like I'd chosen the right option. He inspected me up and down again, slowly this time, and his right hand figured that gold cross around his neck. Then I watched as his face suddenly went sour and he got in the car. I stood there as he turned on the ignition and he stuck his head out from out of the window. Hey, I liked you better from the back, by the way. He sped off, leaving me still practically naked in the AMP parking lot. Thank you. All right, up next is Max Schaefer. Hi guys, um, I'm going to read a few poems for you today and uh, I wasn't sure how to introduce my thesis as a whole in terms of an overarching theme so I just picked a few that I uh, hoped wouldn't bore you to death. Um, this first one is called The Price of Poems. Reading a book of poetry recently, I began to contemplate the price. On the back flap, I found my answer. $22 US higher in Canada, which begs the question, how bad has it gotten up there? This book could very well cost $10,000. Clothing stores in Ontario are lined with shirts that cost an arm, jeans that cost a leg. There are toothbrushes the price of an SUV, and in Quebec, the latest lottery winnings were a pair of socks. They forked out only one, a reasonable tax on such an enormous sum. A man recently cashed in his Roth IRA for an espresso and baguette. A woman in Prince Edward Island was forced to sell her jet in exchange for her son's college loans, but I hear this is about the same in the US for room and board alone. And most notably, a boy no older than 12 has injured himself on a skateboard he purchased with the money made off his mother's Rolex watch, resulting in a hospital trip at which his parents could breathe a sigh of relief. At least the healthcare up there is still free. <laughs> I read that to a friend the other day, actually, and uh, when I was finished, he looked up at me and he said, where'd you hear all those news reports? <laughs> I guess the humor was uh, lost on him, <laughs> not you guys. Um, this next one, I guess, is kind of my conception of the passage of time uh, and how it might pass between two people who were once in love. Um, this is called The Burning. There was occasion when I thought it might cease, a rhythmic, grow weak in the night and expire, or slow enough for the cars passing by to beep, mime their noiseless shouting, flip us the finger, and speed on. But in so many years, it has grown swift and shatters along its tracks now, pulled by some engine of irony and unconcern. There will be no time of which our essence is made, nor will there be time to lament this great undoing. There's not time enough for dinner or even coffee. And as the clock burns brighter on the wall, we press the minutes to our eyes like fingers in hopes we might slow the fire. Uh, this next one, I guess, is kind of a metaphor uh, between a girl, dancing, and Microsoft Word. Uh, it's, it's called fonts. She unfolds her laptop and lays it on top her desk. The teal cashmere sweater hugs her breasts, high fives her waist, and she is dancing, no less. Each keystroke some new address. The W, a two-step, Q, Calypso, the Samba, S. I let her lead while I clumsily bang her knee or crunch a toe. I press B, her C, and she tells me what she needs is space. So I tap it and move a quarter inch more from her face, but this is not enough, she says. I watch her tab over wildly, adjust the margins, and change the font. She has become courier new. I'm stuck in Comic Sans. <laughs> this was all unplanned, so I close out quickly and reopen to reboot. But she has saved as, exported to PDF, and switched rooms. It's just me now, dancing some solitary waltz, keeping rhythm with my keys while I try to remember her voice. Um, this next one is actually the title of my entire thesis. It's about the, uh, I guess, somewhat recent Malaysian Airlines crash. And I guess there's uh, some headline today they found some more information out that's not in here. Uh, <laughs> I can't help you. This is called Cl Close for a Ghost. All right, good night. Flight 370 is vanished still into what seems like air, 
maybe deep water, according to some. The wife of the one American on board believes her husband is alive. She knows how valuable Americans are in these situations. She has packed a bag with clothes for him for when he returns for a ghost. She checks his Facebook for vital signs, a scant SOS or beacon, but often grows weary and returns to bed in tears. I believe they know its whereabouts, the plane. I think something sinister is happening. I think we are being fooled. 227 people disappear like contrails in the night, and there are no answers. Not one of us is safe. Who then will pack a bag for me when I disappear? Who will kiss my picture and tell the news stations I am alive? Um, two more. This next one is called The Graduate. It's kind of self-explanatory. <laughs> the Graduate. When I leave here, we too will cease. The enormity of us, absent, empty bins. This city is crumbling. Red and white brick returned to dust rolls towards us now. Get out, we yell over the other screams, but the purpose is long since gone, and the homeless giggle as our houses fall one by one like candle pins. Um, this last one, I don't know if anybody else has this issue, but like some nights, most nights I'll wake up at three or four to get a drink of water. My roommates can attest to this. Um, and the frequency at which it happens is like a little bit concerning to me. Um, so I wrote a poem about it because of course that solves everything. Um, and it's an embellishment of this, so don't, don't get any ideas. This is called The Madman. <laughs> I am doing things in my sleep, like eating and walking naked through the house. The neighbors have not complained yet, at least, although I leave most blinds completely open. Maybe they like it, this sad young adult feeding and stumbling about unhinged, seemingly drunk. They don't buy cable. Instead, they awake when the fridge swings ajar at 4 a.m. to reveal my form wincing against the light, tomatoes, sausages, and uncooked broccoli sprouts. These hungry voyeurs watch me, laughing, while I fumble with the tinfoil, digging for a slice of pizza. I clear my way past the edamame and baby carrots, straight to the cupcakes and leftover pie. And they are glued to this thickening plot, they spill their butterless popcorn in sheer surprise as I consume yet another spoonful of chocolate yogurt, three handfuls of potato chips, and a gigantic swig of OJ. I await the morning they pull me aside and recommend a vegan diet, a pair of sweats, and a new set of blinds. Thank you. <laughs> Up next is Victoria Trentacross. So um, I've been working um, this semester on a novella, um, so it's all one piece. Um, it's called Corporate Silence, um, not too far from an experience I had last summer working in corporate, in corporate America. Um, so I'm just going to read you some excerpts from it. So this is just a little bit of a forward to set everyone up. I've spent a long time lying to people, and by people I mean myself. It's become a habit. But I guess if I'm going to tell the truth about anything, it should be this. It started the summer after I graduated from Boston College. I had a degree in marketing, an apartment to myself, and a job working for one of the top marketing companies in New York. Of course, I was quite impressed with myself. I was convinced that marketing meant advertising and numbers didn't exist in a creative workplace. It took me a month to figure out I was wrong. It took me even longer to admit it. Adidas was a client of the company I had just started working for, but we weren't in charge of their billboards in Times Square. Yulia Marketing Co. was hired to plan the dinner parties our clients were having to promote their brand, the lunch meetings to sign deals for commercials and internet ads. As the mere marketing apprentice, I was blind. All I saw was my strong, powerful boss and the opportunity to make something of myself, to have my name known, at least to have it known to somebody. The only problem was what went along with that name, the person. I hadn't figured that part out yet. It took me over a year of ignoring who I was before I understood what I wanted, which was to be doing anything than what I was doing, and left the company. As for the people who I worked with, I don't know if I ever understood them. Or worse, maybe there was a time when I did. Chapter 1. The girl had been left to sit alone in the conference room. 
The dark wood table in the center made the room feel narrow. It was the kind of table that cost more than it was worth simply because the buyer, by principle, didn't care about the price. It rounded at the corners in a floor de lis style with a gold trim groove along the edge. The artificial lights above reflected off its clean surface in little yellow discs. Empty chairs lined the table like expectant listeners, like a panel of critics. Their black leather cushions looked new as if no one had actually ever used them. A clear window filled the entirety of one wall and looked down to the street where coffee carts and food trucks scattered the sidewalk. Inside the building, workers flashed past the hallway outside the conference room. The doors to the room were frosted glass, just thin enough to hear the elevators, yet just thick enough to keep any conversations locked inside. After several minutes, the door swung open and a tall woman entered the room. Her dark hair fell perfectly around her powdered face. Her eyes were smoked with a smooth liner and her lips dressed in a commanding red lipstick. Her pressed pencil skirt in charcoal gray and a white silk blouse created the perfect hourglass silhouette. There was the faintest scent of a perfume floating around her. It smelled of warm spices mixed with blossoms, like it had been imported from Paris or India via England. Everything in the room shrunk when she entered as if bowing to her presence. She eyed the girl who stood and smoothed down her pants. Cadence, I presume, the woman stated. My name is Julia Hawkins. If you get hired, you'll be working under me. Please sit. The girl obeyed. I've brought an additional copy of my resume, she said, as well as a portfolio with some projects I've worked on. I need someone who can follow directions and execute whatever things might come up, whether or not I'm here to direct, Julia said. I take directions quite well, the girl said. I mean, I've helped on a lot of projects, but I've led some too. I can think on my own. The woman continued to question the girl. She asked how well she knew basic computer programs, how well she knew more advanced computer programs, if she was able to take notes well, whether or not she was organized. <laughs> You'd be working mostly with Alina, Julia said, who helps with the project, so I need someone who can balance many different jobs. Julia flicked through the girl's resume and portfolio. Her eyes barely grazed each page before she turned to the next. I need someone who can learn. That's me, the girl said. I'm very good at taking directions and developing. Julia tossed the papers down on the table and looked at the girl. Her gaze was calculated her eyes steady and piercing. All right then, Julia said and rose. The girl followed, we'll be in contact. Um, so the way that I actually have been working is a form inspired by Lori Moore's anagrams where you actually switch between third person and um, first person. So obviously the forward was in first person, that was the third, um, flipping back to first person. The muffins at the bakery on 11th never tasted as good as they looked. But when we were feeling optimistic, Shauna and I would trek to the West Village hoping the atmosphere would make up for it. Paying an extra subway fare for someone to put a leaf design in our lattes made us feel independent. <coughs> Shauna had a theory about people who worked in coffee shops. She believed they were the darkest and most cynical people in the world. <laughs> I work in a coffee shop. <laughs> <laughs> People who serve coffee always have snarky, sarcastic undertones in their voice, Shauna said. I thought their tone was more sincere. But then again, I didn't consider myself a pessimist. Shauna was the kind of girl who tried to get people to confess their greatest fears within the first five minutes of meeting them. I preferred to find out what movie they most recently saw. I can't believe you have a job working in New York City, Shauna said as she stared at me from over her steeping green tea. Her painted fingers clutched the red mug. She had a theory about people who worked in the city, too. They were the closest people to perfection. I rolled my eyes. You work in the city, too, you know, I said. She peered at me over her glasses. You know what I mean. You have an office and a mailing address and free coffee and a whole selection of working men to look at. I never said anything about free coffee, I said. Cadence, I'm sure they can afford a Keurig, Shauna said. Maybe. If not, I would settle for a few attractive men in fitted suits. I knew Shauna from high school. She had gone to an arts college, but dropped out after three semesters, claiming the curriculum was too confining for an artist. Now she drew caricatures of tourists outside Central Park. I tried to be supportive, but I couldn't help wonder if she would ever actually do something. Back in college, I thought it was edgy and cool that she had a job as a street artist. She was out there making money while I was sitting in a classroom. Once I graduated and got a job, I began to feel that just having a job wasn't enough. It was what job you had that mattered. For Shauna, there was no one above her to impress, no one below her to direct, and no one who actually ever remembered her name. 
I couldn't imagine a worse job. So this is skipping forward a little bit. Um, she's just finished having a conversation um, on the phone with her mom. My mom would never admit it, but she was upset I wasn't living at home. She liked to find ways of reminding me I had moved out as if I had forgotten. I loved my parents, but home had become an escape from everything else. I knew I could never have a chance at throwing myself into my job unless I was living on my own. After I hung up, I made some tea and watched Project Runway. I folded the tag of the tea bag into a tiny cup. I hated origami. It was too technical, yet somehow I always found ways of doing it. I placed the cup on a book in the center of the coffee table. I hated first days. There was always something unsettling about starting a new job, a new year, walking into a room with no idea of what to expect. I tugged at the ends of my hair. Shauna always said I did that when I was uncomfortable. I tried to laugh when I did it to prove otherwise. Um, this is again just skipping ahead um, from just a scene when she's working uh, in the office starting to do stuff. The trifold boards lay in the corner like children's books on a shelf after the children had after the child had grown up. The girl pulled one out, her fingers slipping on the layers of dust. Each board was covered with sleek invitations, embossed menus, shimmering table cards. Dates and version counts were written below each, faintly sketched in pencil as if not intended to be noticed. The pieces had been poorly glued on. The edges were pulling away from the cardboard and bending the cards. Some had already fallen off and lay crumpled in a pile on the carpet. Rectangular outlines of their past homes remained on the board like gravestones. The construction paper had been intended to act as an artful border, something to make the white trifold board less apparent. What do you think you're doing? The girl jumped and turned around to find Ed standing belly out behind her. Alina made those. Why are you touching them? Alina said I should use the boards as examples for a project, she, the girl said. I was just going to look at them. Ed snorted. Just don't ruin them. He gave the girl a slight snarl as he walked away. The girl carefully dragged the boards back to her cubicle. Their stiff backs formed a fort around her desk. Thanks for coming, everybody. Thanks to our readers. We are done.